England's rivers are filled with a chemical cocktail of sewage, agricultural waste and plastic. Well, the Worldwide Fund for Nature has said our rivers are being used as open sewers. Thousands of fish died in Devon earlier this month when an agricultural pollutant got into the river. Only 14% of the country's rivers have a good ecological status. Rivers are the lifeblood of our landscapes coursing through countryside, towns and cities for thousands of miles. They are a source of life, create critical habitats for myriad species and are a vital source of fresh water for us. The River Otter lies right on my doorstep and is such an important place for me to sit and watch the local beavers or run alongside it or even cycle. But have we become disconnected with what lies beneath the surface of our rivers and the reality of the state that they're in? Our daily lives depend on access to clean fresh water. In the UK, each of us uses an average of 150 litres per day. But as we draw from rivers, we are also polluting them, stripping their ability to function as a life source, a habitat and an ecosystem resulting in over 80% of rivers in England now in poor health. In the face of the climate and biodiversity crises, it has become abundantly clear that we need to restore the health of our fractured ecosystems and help our rivers recover before we push them over the edge. Over the course of this film, we're going to be exploring the concept of river buffers, a measure that might help us in restoring our rivers. I'm going to be digging deep to understand exactly what a river buffer is, the different shapes they might take and how they could help. And I'm also going to be exploring above and below the surface and seeing firsthand what lies beneath. So I've come to a spot at the top of Bodmin Moor and I'm here to meet Arlen Rickard, who's Chief Policy Advisor for the Rivers Trust. So, he knows his rivers and I can't think of a better person to speak to when I'm on the start of my journey really, talking about buffers and what they might mean for our rivers in England. I'm going to show you some wonderful wetland, upland bogs. Great, I can't wait. <laughs> it's beautiful. So this, this wetland is a really good example of a really excellent functioning wetland. It's mm -hmm. still a semi-natural habitat but it's in recovery and it's doing really well. This is the beginning of the river and beneath our feet is the classic sphagnum moss, which grows really abundantly in this area. And as the rain falls on this little bit of bog we're looking at now, it captures the rain. You can see it's like a sponge, yeah. it's just magic. And it can hold eight times its weight in water and keeps the river flowing throughout the summer period in the drought. And in the winter, when we have heavy rain, it captures the water and stops us from flooding. Throughout the length of the river, wetlands provide an important buffer between the river and the agricultural practice or, or urban environments around. Yeah. So they are critical and we've lost 90% of our wetlands in England. So we need to rebuild that to rebuild resilience. How could a buffer zone physically help a wetland to restore and bounce back from being damaged? Well, buffer zones are really, really important and they're so much more than just a strip of land beside a river. A, a good buffer zone will, will encompass the geomorphology, that's the flow of the water to the river, and it will recognise where the wetlands should be forming. And in a wetland, you'll capture sediment and runoff and soil. We lose nearly three million tonnes a year of soil, simply running off land. And that runs, eventually runs to the sea. But further down, where farming is much more intensive, um, the wetlands are even more critical because they will trap a lot of the, the, the sediments, the nutrients coming off the agricultural land. And it's the last chance to trap that and catch it before it reaches the river itself. They really are one of the most important aspects of our countryside and often overlooked. And we can already see the impacts of climate change with increasing frequency of droughts and floods and correctly designed buffer zones incorporating a range of different types of wetlands will protect our environment and provide resilience as climate change increasingly puts pressure on us. Despite the complex issues our rivers are facing, Arlen has outlined what seems a pretty simple measure in helping them towards recovery, allowing for a buffer zone along our rivers that could help restore wetlands, minimise runoff 
and create a spacious zone along riverbanks where nature can thrive. Next stop on my journey, I'm heading to meet Mike Blackmore on the banks Hi, of a chalk stream in Salisbury. How's it going? Hi, welcome to the River Wiley. Here in England, we have over 85% of the world's chalk streams. These man-made systems have become an integral part of our natural environment and a hotspot for fishing. Globally rare, they are a critical habitat for a significant number of species. But like the majority of our rivers, they are in trouble. But here, there is restoration work underway that is helping the river recover. What you'll see here, just as we come round the corner, is, is an area of this river where a really wide section of buffer is making a really big difference to the ecology of the river. This sloping transitional habitat from the, the field up there down, down to the river um, has allowed for a succession of different plants to establish. We've got a much higher level of biodiversity here. Um, going from the, the aquatic environment, slowly transitioning up into a terrestrial environment. Before the restoration work was done, there was very little of this sort of habitat available on, on this section of river. And so moving the fence line back, so excluding the livestock and um, regrading this bank has essentially allowed for a, for a huge increase in, in, in biomass and biodiversity here. And at the, the end result is the people that use this river, the, the fishing club here, actually have a much healthier river um, in which to, to practice their sport. What worries you about the state of British rivers and the, their future at the moment? So, you know, the biggest concern for me on the chalk streams is a big drought. They're not particularly drought resilient. We can make them more drought resilient, but that's, that's a big task. Is it a realistic prospect for us to expect there to be buffer zones across rivers in England in the near future? It's part of what is needed for the full restoration of these habitats. They need the space to create an environment that can breathe with, with changes in flow. We're starting, I hope, to think about rivers, not just as a means of getting water off the land and out to sea, that it's something that it's actually has a value. That can only be good for the rivers. So I love that. I've never seen a chalk stream before and I've been wanting to see them for ages. And I think what has really stuck with me is the fact that what was once originally a man-made habitat has now slowly become a really, really important one for tons of species. And I think it shows that if given the space, nature and agriculture and man-made things can actually almost enhance each other. Many of us have become disconnected from what lies beneath the surface, but not Jack Perks. For the past 10 years, he has been filming underwater in our rivers, fascinated by freshwater and the species and habitats it supports. I'm off to meet Jack at one of his favourite freshwater snorkelling spots. But before we dive beneath the surface, I'm keen to understand what it is about this environment that has kept him close for over a decade and the changes he has seen. So Jack, your fascination with filmmaking and freshwater habitats has taken you all over the country. What's drawn you to these habitats in the first place? Well, it's a hidden world, isn't it? Most of us walk along the riverbank and we see the kingfishers and we see the herons, but the fish are often hidden. So that's what kind of drives me to show that hidden world. These rivers are the arteries of the UK. They've got so much wildlife on them that most of us just don't get to see. All life needs water. So if you go near a river, there's going to be life. Over your years of uh, filming freshwater habitats and diving below the surface, have you seen any changes to them? It's becoming harder to find rivers that are clear, full of fish and full of life. And I, I'm really struggling. And these changes that you describe, where are they coming from and what are they doing to the fish themselves? I mean, it's a cocktail of problems, really. The water quality is without a doubt the biggest issue for our fish because it's a slow killer. So things like agricultural runoff, road runoff, sewage, they don't necessarily kill the fish, but they'll degrade the spawning habitat. So the adult fish will cling on, but the smaller fish just don't come through. You don't get that recruitment. There is this massive downward trend of our rivers, and if we don't act soon, mm. we're gonna lose some iconic species. Talking of species, you're gonna take me under the water. What kind of things might we see today? Well, we're here on the, on the Tavi, as I say. It's a fantastic salmon river, this sea trout. Uh, maybe an eel if we're lucky, so it's going to be great. I can't wait to get in. 
Sir Jamil. <laughs> Off we go. You've got much bigger things than I have. It's not the size that counts, it's how you use them. <laughs> <laughs> Diving into the freezing water with Jack, I wasn't sure what to expect. But as soon as we're submerged, we enter a different world. Aquatic plants cling onto the rocks, leaves litter the riverbed, and Jack catches a fleeting glimpse of a brown trout in the torrents. And then, out of the depths of a deep pool, fighting against the rushing river, a salmon emerges. And I begin to realise just how much life is here below the surface. That was amazing! Oh, it was great. Oh my gosh! It's Refreshing. Just a yeah, it's just a completely different world, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. That and, salmon was amazing. Yeah, it was so much bigger than I thought. Oh, amazing, thank you. No worries. Coming face to face with one of the most iconic species that inhabit our rivers and seeing firsthand the role buffers can play in protecting them, it seems that making space for buffer zones along our waterways is a no-brainer. So I'm left feeling, what's the catch? Over 70% of land in the UK is dedicated to agriculture. So understanding what it might take to encourage farmers and landowners to make room along our waterways for buffers is really important. So I'm actually on my way north at the moment to meet two people who know a lot more about buffers than I do. Um, and I think there's a lot of complexity that I need to unpick about buffers and making space for rivers, but from a landowner's point of view. Claire Robinson of the National Farmers Union works closely with farmers and landowners regarding environmental issues. And I'm keen to hear her thoughts on how setting aside space for buffers on farmland might work and what might need to be put in place to help this happen. Well, the sunshine is beautiful, know, isn't it's it? So obviously it's really easy for conservationists and NGOs and environmental organisations to come up to farmers and list all the benefits of leaving aside an area of land next to a river. But what are you concerned about for farmers? So you've got to find a balance that works for both the farming business as well as what nature wants. Farmers need to think about how a buffer strip fits in with the whole business. If you're looking to, to put land aside so it's more for nature, it's obviously got to be work, work as part of the farming system. If the right payment scheme was in place for farmers to set aside this area of land, depending on what that looks like, is this something that the NFU would encourage farmers to apply for? Uh, well, of course. I think you need to develop the vision working with a few farmers so yeah. that you can understand why they might be concerned. If you are looking at something that could be land use change, you need a funding stream that matches that. So one of our members, Richard Bramley, he's got a river bank that is also a flood defence and then next to that on the field side he's also put some land aside is actually then planted or is managing in a re regenerative fashion the land next to that bank. Excited to hear that Richard Bramley has buffers in action on his land my next stop is to visit his farm in York and understand the impact of this on his business and farming. So we're standing next to a buffer sort of zone here what impact has this had on your farm? When it comes to setting land aside, in this instance, I don't feel it has a huge negative impact. When I see the bird surveys and I see that, you know, we've still got good populations of corn buntings. Where I'm stood here, I'm watching little flocks of finches just popping in and out, and that's really re rewarding. I'm working equally as hard to make sure that the farm is producing stuff. But once you've got it in your mind that you can also complement that with improving the biodiversity on the farm as well, then you kind of get hooked. Personally, my viewpoint is that's the only way forward. And that is to both be able to recognise that farming is something that we need. It has to produce our food. But we also can't discount the fact that farming has had an impact. And what we can do is we can improve biodiversity on farm, creating habitat for insects, in the process we are improving productivity, we're improving our, the resilience of our soils. So there's multiple benefits. So if we're asking farmers to set aside more areas of their land, is this something that the government should be supporting? Well the answer is it needs long-term 
commitment to funding. Government can have a role in facilitating. The key thing for me is going to be around reward and simplicity. And if what we really value is more wetland, then that does have to be reflected somehow back on farm for the, for the long term. There's a lot of good going on out there and we need to culture on that good. Back home in Devon, I have one final meeting with a group of young students and I'm really curious to hear how the next generation perceive the concept of buffers and whether they seem important to them. So guys, how about we talk a bit about why we love rivers so much? What is it about them that you really like? Especially during lockdown, I really liked going here uh, like every day and there's, there was usually herons and birds a lot of rivers in England are actually in a lot of trouble. So at Beaver Trust, we're really excited about a concept called river buffers, where basically we're allowing just a little bit of space between the river and an area of active land to maybe act as a bit of a sponge and help the river recover. Do you think this might be a good idea for our rivers? Some of the things that are used to make sure plants grow or don't have insects on can be poisonous to animals, and we definitely don't want that in the river. So a river buffer would reduce the chance of that. A buffer would also help um, stop floods again, which can also help with farmland and um, um, villages. What are you guys excited about this year for nature? People are noticing more than they did last year, and I think more people will be uh, trying to work out how to help rivers. As they get more healthier, there will be more beavers and like so much more wildlife. Also, I think people are realising if we don't act now, there's going to be no second chance, so we have to do it while we can. Up until now, we have looked to take as much as we can from our landscape, whether it's for our survival, farming, building, often working right up to the very edge. But we are now facing one of the biggest challenges we have ever experienced as climate change offers an unpredictable future. Ensuring our life support systems are in the best health possible is crucial in giving us a fighting chance. We know that British rivers are in trouble, and we've known for some time. But this journey has shown hopeful demonstrations of a real solution, river buffer zones. I've seen how varied buffers are and how they can actively restore rivers, be it wetlands trapping pollutants, fencing back the edge of chalk streams, or farmers benefiting from nature returning to their land, buffers offer us all a beacon of hope for healthier river systems. As freshwater habitats waver on the edge of survival, it is now up to us to make room for rivers, to call upon our government to support buffers and return the space our rivers need to recover and to thrive.